housing and health. I think it all kind of goes very much hand in hand. You may have read, if you live in Walton, your life expectancy is going to be 15 years lower than someone who lives in Chilwall. What we're hoping to achieve with the Assembly is, is that we um, hear what you want to see develop as policy. Um, so your suggestion are being taken forward to, on the one hand, Love Wavertree, but on the other hand also to Liverpool City Council. And we have direct contacts there, they're really interested. So there's a real wish to engage with local communities in order to find out what we can all do together in a way. So citizens' assemblies, I'm not sure if anyone's taken part in them before, but they're widely used now. So Camden in the borough of in London has had a wide range citizens' assembly on climate change, as is Oxford. And probably a notable one is the UK citizens' assemblies in 2019 and 2020, which was to set out the scene for what would a net zero future look like. The purpose of this project really is to understand how citizens can influence changes to climate change influences and policy and changes to our own behaviour. So today we're going to be focusing on issues associated with housing. So really we wanted to understand how we could build a shared understanding of climate. So what we're going to do today is really share our knowledge on what we think the issues of climate change is. We're going to hear from some experts about specific subjects and then we're going to come together and build up our ideas on the types of changes that we might want to see, the changes that we could make ourselves and the influence that maybe we could have on policy makers. Cheryl, could you tell us a little bit about Liverpool Healthy Homes and how the work that you're doing could potentially impact on climate? Yeah, just going back slightly, Healthy Homes is partly is funded by the public health team at Liverpool City Council. The reason why I come about is, is to look at the link between housing and health and to look at reducing health inequalities. So basically we're looking at doing interventions into people's properties to help lift in terms of the energy efficiency of the property and to us able to go in and give them general, what we call behavioural advice about how you live in your property, how you manage the property. Um, at the moment, we're involved in, with, the, with Bays, who, are, who have give, provided funding in terms of driving like a, more of a green agenda across the country so that we're working with Liverpool City Regions combined authority so we're in phase two of that at the moment. What we're looking at there is we're looking at going into people's properties and doing like an intervention in the sense of what an energy what the most effective and efficient energy efficiency measure would be done in that property. So what do you look at? They look at the property itself, the energy performance of the property and also the occupancy and the occupant's behaviour of managing the property. What they do then is like a bespoke recommendation in terms of what would be the most effective way to reduce carbon emissions and also the resulting um, outcomes in terms of reducing people's bills and making the property warmer for people to stay in. So that is bespoke to each individual property. Now the funding from that is targeted primarily at people who own their own property. So if people meet a certain criteria, which is if they're on a, like, a low income or they earn less than £30,000 a year, or if their property is band D, E, F or G, which are the lower rated energy performance, they can get funding up to an average of £10,000 per property. Now, there's others coming off that. Come, moving forward, we've got the Sustainable Warm Fund. We're looking to do interventions. So we're looking to avoid using fossil fueled interventions. So we're looking at things like air source heat pumps, solar panels. We're having what they call a fabric first approach, which is make, making sure the property you know, you're not losing energy unnecessarily and you're making it more efficient to run. The other streams of that is there's the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund. So that's working with the um, RSLs in the city, looking at um, driving forward and making interventions there. And then finally, it's what they call the Homes Upgrade Grant, where there's properties that are off-grid. And when we say off-grid, they're normally powered through electricity, which is very, very expensive to run if you've got a property that's heated mainly through electric heaters. So that's another um, 
part of it. But just going back to housing and health and carbon emissions and the green agenda, I think it all kind of goes very much hand in hand. For health inequality, that is, you may have read, if you live in Walton, your life expectancy is going to be 15 years lower than someone who lives in Chilwell. So it's reducing those inequalities to make it fairer, really, across the city. So we're looking at raising people's expect expectancies and people's quality of life. And also, you know, it's difficult to think if you're in fuel poverty, the biggest concern for yourself is trying to keep yourself warm. Now, hopefully, with the interventions we're going to be doing through the Sustainable Warm Fund, that'll be a lot more greener and cleaner in terms of supporting people living in their properties. OK, uh, so how would people be able to be part of this programme? I'll um, share our email address so people can, you can look at Liverpool City Council's website, look at the Healthy Homes webpage. You can also email retrofits at liverpool.gov.uk to make an inquiry. And very much, very much of the view is if you're unsure and you think you might, might be entitled to it, or even if you think, I'm, I'm not entitled to it, just please email us because we don't like to turn people away and we like to be able to give people advice for where they can go or maybe we can signpost people. So we also work in partnership with other organisations. So we work with National um, Energy Action, which is a charity, and we work with Energy Project Plus as well. So they can get different kinds of funding streams, so they can do other interventions and can support people, so they can come out and visit people at home as well to go through like the behavioural change and give them advice. Take up's really good. We're getting a huge influx, obviously, sadly, because of the um, the tariff being taken off. People obviously we say sadly, you know, people's bills are going through so people are looking at ways to make the properties more energy efficient. So what we're hoping to do is um, under phase two of this local authority delivery scheme that we've done, we've aiming to do 400 properties so that you'll receive one or more measures that'll be done in june that's currently being managed by liverpool city regions combined authority under the sustainable warm fund we're aiming to do approximately 700 properties citywide as well and then also as i say part of the offshoots is the social housing decarbonisation fund and this home, un grant, home, up grants, home upgrade scheme. Again, those two aspects are being managed by the Liverpool City, Liverpool City Regions Combined Authority. We're managing the Sustainable Warm Fund directly ourselves. I know a lot of times there are issues that overlap between Redford City and Northern Bank within properties as well. Is that kind of brought in the Redford for the retrofit, we can't use retrofit money to deal with disrepair issues. Some of the interventions that we do can go ahead and resolve some of the issues that people have. Now, in terms of, say, if people were owner-occupier and there's sub substantial disrepair and we felt it posed a risk to the person living there, we would be looking to work with our environmental health officers to look at doing interventions in that person's property. Um, but again, there's very, very limited funding available, so that's not always feasible to go ahead and do that intervention. For private sector rented properties, we're looking, obviously looking to work with the landlords, and I don't know if you're aware that the landlord licensing schemes recently been relaunched um, across the city. I know there's a few wards that aren't involved. So what the private um, sector housing team are looking at is Mees performance, which is m minimum energy efficiency standards. So, strictly speaking, a property shouldn't be rented out if it's in a band F or a band G. Now, obviously, landlords, people can apply for an exemption. So, say, for example, someone has a property that's a band G, there's some kind of architectural reason it's in a conservation area, it's going to cost the landlords far too much money to bring it up to standard. People can apply for an exemption. So part of the private sector house and team, when they're going out doing visits, people living in a cold home or a very, a very cold home is classed as a hazard. So it's a health and safety hazard under what they call house and health and safety rating system. So that could be a category one hazard. So they would then work with the landlords to resolve that for that occupants of the property there. 
if nobody else has got any questions, just want to say thanks for Cheryl for coming along. And I think it was really interesting, from my perspective anyway, to hear about how all the different policies are connected yeah. to the issue. So health very much working hand in hand with other elements of the programme in terms of the environment. Yeah, we do lots of joint up work. And so, say for example, one of our engagement officers goes out. People may say, this sounds kind of random, I'm going to throw in now, they may say, I want to give up smoking, so we'll work with smoking cessation. Some may say I'm really suffering badly from depression, feel really unwell. We'll do interventions with like Careline, we'll have like local organisations involved. We'll also do things like if people are struggling financially, we'll arrange for them to get a benefit check from our benefit maximisation service. So when we've been doing that, we've been like what we call leveraging for the customer. So we've been able to leverage about 1,600 quid per customer of benefit checks being done on average to make sure they're getting the right um, benefits and income coming in as well. So we do that and we'll work with others, if for people who've got fuel debt, we'll work with our colleagues in National Energy Action to be able to work out a payment plan for them going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So the one pound housing scheme in Liverpool is a fantastic scheme that was put in place in the Liverpool area. It consisted of a number of houses or mainly on one street um, where people were able to purchase a property for one pound on with as long as they had a certain criteria. But what that did is one, it allowed people with um, in, in certain scenarios where they might not have been financially able to get on the housing market in other ways, um, get a property at a good price. It also enabled uh, a street that was run down to be invested in and be renovated at a fairly low cost. So it was win-win on both sides. I think schemes like that are fantastic. For 30,000 and one pounds, you can't get a house like that anywhere else and people had a great time. So one of the things that you need to consider uh, when purchasing a property is the maintenance costs. Um, you need to consider the energy you consume, things like gas, electricity. Now, you're going to find that if you consume a lot of electricity and a lot of gas, your bills are going to be a lot higher. Uh, with the current prices at the moment, they're already ludicrously high. The things that will impact your, um, your energy usage will be things like how well your house is insulated. In the winter, if you want to keep your house warm, you are going to have to put the heating on. You need to insulate your house. You need to ensure that your windows are, are double glazed if you really want to maximise the uh, the efficiency of your energy consumption. Otherwise, if you've got single glazed windows, it's likely that the heat will escape there. Again, if your house is not in insulated, then again, you could be losing heat, um, which you're gonna have to make up for with extra energy consumption. So I just wanted to briefly talk about some of the things that James had put together around really this Liverpool city region and some of the assets that we have here. So, so one of the things that James is particularly interested in in his research is renewable energy and the potential of renewable energy to help not only with just the natural environment but also as well in terms of wider economic development and sustainability within the Liverpool city region. So James has is, flagged is three particular projects which I just wanted to mention. So the Bayrou Bank offshore wind farms already provide enough energy here to um, heat 310,000 homes per year. Also as well, the work on Mersey Tidal Power could be potentially something that would aim to generate reliable, clean electricity for up to 1 million homes in the Liverpool city region and beyond. And there's also a proposal to use clean hydrogen. So within the city region in Holton, there's actually a plant that works to sort of recycle hydrogen that could be used for, for power. And another idea as well is community solar powered gardens, so fitting garden areas with solar powers. So touching on Cheryl's presentation, um, the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority aims to bring up to 10,000 homes across the Liverpool City region. So that covers Liverpool, Wirral, Holton, St Helens, Sefton and Knowsley over the next decade. Um, there's £12 billion pounds is required to decarbonise local housing in the region and cities across the world are moving towards a new passive house standard. 
so part of it as well within the Liverpool City region is revaluing our natural environment and thinking about the assets that we have both in green spaces and the blue environment so things like the river Mersey some of our estuaries sort of the natural rivers that we have that flow through the area and then part of it as well is understanding about how we can construct our neighbourhoods so very much of the cities across the world have started to use the concept of a 20 minute neighbourhood which has now gone to a 15 minute neighbourhood so cities including Vancouver, Melbourne have started to look at the idea of how small neighbourhoods could be built so that people can be sustained within them so you would have access to all of the services and transportation that you would need so thinking from a planning perspective really what could be the benefits of that for the environment so things like more walkable spaces for services cycle routes less dependency on traffic what was the community 20 minute community 20 minute neighbourhood Local authorities and cities across the world, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, have started to look at new economic development plans and the changes. Some of the practices that we had before, not only were, were climate unsustainable in that terms, but also economically unsustainable for people. And coronavirus really brought, I think, a, a change in mindset about how we measure success and prosperity as well. So Amsterdam have used the 20 minute neighbourhood concept in their building back better plan for the city. And it's something that more and more local authorities in the UK have started to think about. So Newham in London has started to think about it and they've developed up quite a firm action plan now for the steps that they're going to take to do that. So the 15 minute city concept has been um, adopted globally by many cities probably one of the biggest examples is Paris, um, and if anybody knows Paris, you'll know that for many years it's been synonymous with uh, cars. You just have to think of the Arc de Triomphe, that huge roundabout that it's become with cars whizzing around. But actually, over the last five to ten years, the radical um, leadership of Paris have managed to introduce a lot more cycle lanes um, and make uh, the city a lot more connected via active travel. Um, and transport. Um, it has many beneficial outcomes. Uh, one of the big ones, of course, being that it keeps a lot of money within the local economy. You're no longer traveling to somewhere on the outskirts of town to spend your money, which will disappear to some big financial headquarters down in London or wherever. Um, it means that you can use your local baker, your lo local butcher, uh, your local card shop, your local retail premises, which will keep the money within your community. There's benefits from health as well. Less car dependency, of course, means more walking, uh, healthier lifestyles, less obesity. Um, and of course, there is the, the big one, which is sustainability for um, our environment. Um, most councils in the UK have declared a climate emergency, um, recognizing that man-made pollution is altering our ecosystem. And one of the biggest contributors to that is uh, petrol vehicles and diesel vehicles so by cutting down the need to use those sorts of transportation um, and replacing it with much more healthier greener alternatives by creating these 15 minute cities or these 20 minute neighborhoods um, is a way to help uh, solve the climate crisis. What we we're going to do is based on some of the things that we've talked about this morning if we all think of maybe 10 sort of issues which have come up 10 sorts of problems and maybe 10 solutions to mm -hmm. them. The solutions, what we're going to do is build a sort of report back and share it with the local authority and the combined authority as well. I think, well, these are the sorts of things that residents are saying could be potential solutions. So then just thinking as well around then green and yards and alleys ways and things like that would we say that's a problem now and that we don't we don't do that we don't have enough greening locally and that would be a solution uh yes and so i was thinking i know at the moment it's, it's a bit nippy so um but i know in like in the summer if you're in like a bit of a concrete like a or brick i think it's it very hot it gets very claustrophobic and mm -hmm. you plant the stuff and it can kind of cool you mentioned about air qu air, air mm -hmm. quality and things so there's sort of a yeah, 
in, in the warmer months, there's an aspect to that as well, as well yeah. as mental well-being and stuff. I've seen nursing homes, where, you know, people Late. that will suffer with that heat. Yeah. yeah, so thinking around the screening yards and things like that, do you think they're actions that the local authority could support with more? Or yeah. I know there's like, there is like a there's like a couple of things it's like scouse flower people and there is some people have done the alleys around here like mm. I think there is a helper mm. or anything, but like anyway I, I don't think it's that the government's job to come in and like sort my alley out I think it's our job to sort it out but like support for it how to where do you move stuff to yeah like a blueprint accessible information it. isn't it it's yeah. a bit like what I'm saying with that yeah yeah absolutely a blend in Manchester there was one yeah. high rise block where they fit um, air source heat pumps within that high rise block mm. and it really relates to behaviour so that behaviour at the moment with our gas boilers our gas managers etc and you, you might have heard it at times they say always keep your boiler on keep it on low to kind of get mm -hmm. that general heat while it's counterintuitive because you don't want your boiler on the whole time if you keep it low it's actually they allege cheaper I've got a workmate that tested it because I, I couldn't, I wasn't brave enough to yeah. try that long term and they said that it does work out cheaper. Mm. But that's a heating mentality we need to get onto is to leave, whether it's gas or whether it's air source heat pumps, they have to be left on. I do I do think on that, like, there's, like there will be a design solution. I just like, it's just sort of something that as, a, as, a lay, as lay people, like designers are so clever, you get like four or five designers room, the job it is to find solutions, they'll find a way to put a pump on a terraced house mm -hmm. nicely that, that you just need to like, get people with the, the skills and that in. I do think there's a way. So yeah, I think as well that's the other issue is that it's the solution, the design solutions and the skills there of people mm -hmm. to be able to, so there's something around, I suppose, the resourcing of skills. Yeah. But that. I mean, that, that stuff can be cheap, I think. Like, mm. I mean, I don't know, we've got three unis within, within spitting distance. Mm. So, like, I don't know, they must have design courses. So, we've got about, I don't know, 500 it's design a challenge. Well, <laughs> 500 design students who, you know, will do a lot of work for little, not that much money to build a portfolio or something. So, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I don't, I think there's, there's more. Free there resources is, as well. well yeah. Free skills. Yeah. More labour than you think. Well, there's a low carbon hub um, from the universities. Uh, especially the University of Liverpool and John Moores mm -hmm. um, that works with actually works with businesses and things but that's the you know it, it is about research mm -hmm. and, and, and money available for research and is there an end product for it etc mm -hmm. um, but absolutely just looking at the things we have here there's some things isn't there at an individual level that we could make changes about through better communication so understanding I don't know where you might be able to find information about gardening or growing your own produce or things like that what supports available for people to do this as well because that's another example really is we could come up with policy solutions but thinking about how you resource people to do that so you might be making an ask of an individual to change their behavior but how do you give people the resources to do that the information to do it the skills to do it who, who would be the points of help for people making these changes? Someone, someone community based. You, you, a lot of times, if your neighbour's doing it, you might mm. grab it a bit more as well. I mean, getting it through schools and things like yeah, that. I mean, schools, yeah. like curriculum changes, and I know that's not the council or the authorities necessarily responsibility because it's more national, but. But sort of, yeah, I, I knew what you mean. Yeah. Growing up with an understanding of it is pretty key, isn't it? Because kids, the like, the reason why plastics have... is because of the turtle images. A lot was attributed. I know that's not the whole thing, but when mm. kids saw pictures of turtles with straws in various places that were just killing them and that kind of thing, a lot of the pressure was children telling their parents that they don't need things or they, they should change habits. Mm. I think... It's, yeah, I'd even say sort of, you know, primary level as well, just mm. trying to, but I don't know how you change the curriculum and get certain things on the curriculum for, for kids to start thinking about. Yeah, because I actually noticed in here before that the, there's been some work that the pupils have been doing on carbon. Mm -hmm. And I suppose starting that discussion early with people 
and it's possibly more impactful when you're younger because habits can change earlier, can't they? So thinking about that as well, you were saying before about the role of media and particularly the, the straws one. Do you think focusing in on a specific issue? Because I think climate change can seem really fast mm. to people. So maybe focusing on a specific change in the curriculum or a, speci- you know, a change people could make, do you think that's more useful? I mean, it's got to be small and doable because people can't cope with more than that in reality when they've got everything else going on. But those marginal gains add up. Um, mm. Is it Said, somebody, Black Fox thinking? Yeah, yeah, Matthew, Matthew Said is yeah. the fellow, yeah, so marginal gains. Is, so, like, the, the idea is you make, you know, 12 small, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but it does all add up because. Mm. Get some more well, and to your point before about your work, you know, if you make this change, save 60 quid. 60 quid a month over a year, you know. Yeah, exactly. See, so. see the truth of it. Yeah. One of the things that happened was before the lockdown, um, and we did get help from the city council, we closed that there was a car free day on the yes. high street. Yeah. Mm. But it was, only, it was only four hours, but we called it a day. But that sort of thing, and we had one of those every year, it, it actually opens people's minds mm-hmm. to what can be. Mm-hmm. It was really good, the trouble, it, it was crap weather, it was a shame. Mm-hmm. We had a cricket match down the high street. <laughs> oh, cool. and, it, it, and things like that people remember. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you have it every week or whatever. The other thing is, um, we're trying, you know, we've had a little a couple of markets yeah. by Papas across the road. Um, we used to run um, a farmer's market up by the lockup. No, we closed Lake Road. Mm-hmm. So it's getting the council, because we need the council to say, yeah, we'll close the road for you for six hours or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And yeah, it's a pain, and we'll have to reroute the bus routes for that time. Mm-hmm. But it, it, they would see it as a, as a, as a millstone. Mm-hmm. Actually, if the council looked at it as an asset mm-hmm. in the long run, then you can do it, and that's a small. There's a relatively mm. small thing. Mm. Like that's the thing. I, I like. I, I just. I think it's like a couple of marginal gains, and you wouldn't need a bin collection. Mm. Like so, there's by the aquatic centre. There's a couple of those recycling, you know, sort of plastic units for your glass or a few bits of pop. Mm. But like, if you get a milkman, they take the eggs back, have a refillable thing within 20 minutes walk to you, use a composter. Yeah, you'll mm. have a little bit, but I, I think you could get to a point where you. I've done it literally, like, I've got down to like one plastic bin a month with like a mm. lot of just like marginal stuff and it is doable, it's just like little habits, so right. back to your point of communication, it's just, it's you know, a, a, a hundred people, if, if everyone on the street's doing the same little marginal gain, it adds up to be a big change. There, yeah. there is a part to that, that like uh, across some of the companies now there's a new course called Carbon Literacy and uh, they're, you know, it's becoming kind of popular to train staff in that but the same carbon literacy project are, are making an equivalent course they're working on one for individuals residents just across and that's a commercial thing but i do see a benefit of having just a general course that covers some of those marginal gains and starts a conversation and everyone could start at that point and then come back not for more carbon literacy training but just to kind of reflect on what they've done and mm. share good practice maybe. And this information that is. Mm. So it's like reflecting on what you've learned then. Yeah, there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. You know, if someone saves money, they don't keep it to themselves a lot of the time. They're quite proud that you've kind of done something yeah. better. But it is uh, another thing that's on the rise is eco-anxiety and involves students in and, and make use of that but I think yeah getting people involved there's a medical side to a lot of what we're talking about but a lot of people are struggling with mental health and one thing that can help tackle that and is starting to maybe happen within doctors practices is to say well there's this community activity that's yes. going on You'll like green subscriptions and that sort of thing where yeah. it's like going up on allotment for a yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. social prescribing right. mm-hmm. yeah. yeah sounds but great it is and yeah like this good gym is a running group that I run with and they kind of do 
um, community things like that and there's, uh, there's a number of us that have struggled with mental health um, issues in the past but from just getting involved in community and stuff it really makes you feel like you part, belong part of Liverpool and it also um, improves Liverpool as well. Yeah, a wide well, range of people as well isn't it? Yeah. I love Wavertree do that which is great there's a little running group there. yeah, there's an nice art step. group and all this stuff yeah, because one of the things you've all mentioned, and I think when I look at these later, we'll probably find it's quite a lot, is about com- community. That's something that's really mm. come through from our conversation. Mm. And it, that's different ways, isn't it? It's creating like the relationships within the community, but also as well. I think what's really important is the respect and value in community's intelligence and skills. But if, yeah, and if you don't embed it, then it's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. You can wax lyrical about how great a policy is, but if people then don't do it... Yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Stuff like on, on the housing front, I meant to buzz in the way with your WhatsApp group, but like, you know, like tool library, sharing, like, oh, um, yeah. sharing tools yeah. and stuff, because that's what I've been doing my front step. And like, so now I've got, you know, a bunch of trowels and this and then this, and I've got this mm. other stuff, and it's A, terraced out, just like, find someone to put them, but I'm like, Rather me have to get this stuff or somebody else have to get this stuff next year. Yeah. Must have like a little little library. So maybe mm. you know, maybe even look away with your shop or something, but that's mm. I, I guess environmentally it's more like a, a, a re reuse yeah. less less more, just reuse what you've got sort of thing. Mm. But um, again that's sort of thing. Every, every little borough could probably have it. It's not rocket science. There are enough, there are enough old fellas who would knock around with sheds full of other stuff. Yeah. A lot of them are quite nice and they usually lend them out anyway. So You, know. you do have to do a lot of research. Having just moved here in October, yeah. Yeah. I just had to find my way but and just kind of you know look on various groups, follow various accounts. and. Mm. It did feel very disjointed. Very, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I, yeah. made, I had to make the effort because I wanted to. But again, as I always say, I think we're the minority in terms of people that are going to make that effort because yeah. of everything else that's going on with people with it, whether it be children or oh, yeah. health or economic situation you can't blame people for not engaging it's got to be made easier so yeah, okay. and everyone has a phone well the majority of people yeah. have phones that have google maps yeah. on that sort of thing don't they so i see uh, the main problem is the it's a poor quality of housing stock we have a lot of Victorian houses, single brick. Uh, this creates a lot of problems. <clears throat> Insulation, condensation, and the general breathing of houses. These older houses tend to be designed to work with a fireplace as opposed to central heating, which is what we have today. Opportunities. Liverpool's been one of the slowest regions for house price growth. So that's an opportunity because we're still a little behind all the other cities in England. However, that is changing very quickly, especially because of outside investors. There's a lot of investors coming from the south, primarily. They're cashing out on their houses or generating finance from their existing houses, which obviously have quite a high value. They're coming up here, finding extremely low prices compared to what they're used to. And um, there's also quite a strong foreign element of investment in Liverpool currently. The problems and the opportunities are dictated by your financial position. So there are a lot of opportunities for landlords and investors. Uh, however, that puts um, people who are just starting out uh, at, a, at a huge detriment in comparison to, to people who are more established in the, uh, on the property ladder. Uh, poor housing can equate to poor health very quickly. It doesn't take long if you've got damp in a property for it to affect your health. Breathing is, uh, can be affected very, very quickly. All you need is damp particles in the air to get on your lungs, which is done in days uh, for you to start feeling symptoms. There are other things that could happen in your property as well, which could contribute to uh, an injury. Properties where they have not been maintained correctly may have uh, structural damage which may fall off. Um, slates on roofs, wood within the property, door frames, any of that, if it is loose, um, can fall and cause an injury. It's very important that houses are kept in a good condition. As a landlord, it is their responsibility to make sure a house is in good condition. As a homeowner, it would be 
upon yourself to ensure that the property is safe for you and your family. Thank you.